So good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you, Sharad Kasimi. She's a second year resident with us, and she will talk today about optimal compartment syndrome. So enjoy. Thank you, Stefan, for the kind introduction. So today I'm going to tell you something about the abdominal compartment syndrome. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with some definitions, then continue with risk factors, the etiologies, um, pathophysiology. Then we come to the diagnosis, uh, how we manage this, the prognosis, and then in the end to the conclusion. So first of all, I'm going to start with the definition. Um, the abdominal compartment syndrome occurs when there is an intra-abdominal pressure, which is elevated over 20 millimeters of mercury, um, and it is associated with a new organ dysfunction or even failure. It can be with an APP, which is um, the abdominal perfusion pressure below 60 millimeters mercury. Um, but we come later to this point, and there are different types that can be primary, it can be secondary, and even recurrent. So the abdominal perfusion pressure, uh, it's a pressure um, which indicates the visceral perfusion. It's calculated by the intra-abdominal pressure minus the mean arterial pressure. The optimal range would be between 50 and 60 millimeters mercury, and maintaining it appears to be associated with improved outcomes. A low APP predicts the necessity of surgical decompression, um, but the uh, World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome made that there is um, no account concerning its use as a resuscitative um, endpoint, uh, since the mean arterial pressure even elevated due to increased systemic vascular resistance, even though cardiac output is low. Thus, hypoperfusion may even occur despite acceptable APP. There are different grading systems. Um, when the pressure in the abdomen is increased, we talk about intra-abdominal hypertension. There are four grades of this. Um, grade one is from 12 to 15 millimeters mercury, grade two, 16 to 20, uh, grade three, 21 to 25, and uh, grade four is about over 25 millimeters mercury. And for grade four, there's the greatest incidence of organ failure, which uh, typically affects heart, lungs and kidneys. Uh, one has to say that the normal intra-abdominal pressure is about 0 to 5 millimeters mercury and in critical ill patients it's uh, already elevated to 5 to 7 millimeters mercury. In obese patients it's normally also higher um, until even 12 to 40 over 40 millimeters mercury and it's basically also physiologically increased in pregnant women. Um, exactly. So now we come to the risk factors that are, uh, for instance, increased intra-abdominal volume by either intraluminal content or increased extraluminal content, or it can be also due to decreased abdominal compliance. Um, abdominal wall compliance is um, basically the uh, elasticity of abdominal wall and diaphragm. Um, it can be also due to a combination of both. It can be due to combination uh, capillary leak and also um, fluid resuscitation. In ICU patients, the main risk factors are mechanical ventilation, ARDS and fluid resuscitation. ASCS can develop basically in all ICU patients. Um, even 35% of ventilated patients were found to have intra-abdominal hypertension or ACS. In a multi-center observational study from 2004 where um, 13 ICUs six of six countries with about 97 patients were um, evaluated um, intra-abdominal hypertension was found in about 50% and ACS in 8% of all ICU patients even. So the etiology, as we already stated, there are primary ACS, uh, which can be a conditions associated with an injury or a disease that uh, is from originated from the abdominal pelvic region. For example, uh, trauma or hemorrhage, bleeding, massive bleedings. Um, it can be due to ileus um, by dilated loops. It can be secondary that uh, do not directly originate from the abdominal pelvic region. For example, due to burns or a massive fluid resuscitation over three liters of uh, volume. Um, it can be recurrent due to conditions in which ACS redevelops 
following previous surgical or medical treatment of primary or secondary ACLs. So now we come to the pathophysiology. In general, bleeding, trauma, and abscesses lead to a physiological response of inflammation and swelling, which leads to an increase of intra-abdominal tension and therefore leads to hypertension in the abdomen. Um, in, due to intestinal obstruction, uh, there will be dilated loops, which lead to compressive symptoms in the abdomen. Um, increased intra-abdominal pressure may begin to involve other organ systems as well. For example, the heart, there will be decreased cardiac filling and cardiac output and increased central venous pressure due to inferior vena and portal vein compression, which will lead to an increase in uh, systemic vascular resistance and, and therefore lead to hypotension. Due to the compression of the lungs, due to the elevated diaphragm, we will have reduced lung compliance, functional residual capacity, tidal volumes, and elevated air pressures, atelectasis, reduced cap in, uh, capillary intrapulmonary um, shunt increases, and then uh, therefore we will have hypoxemia and hypercapnia. One of the first signs may be anuria or even also lower urine output due to the compression of the renal artery and venous um, blood flow to the kidneys, we will have reduced renal perfusion, which will therefore lead to reduced GFR and low urine output. Uh, oliguria may occur um, if there is a IAP of over 15 millimeters mercury, anuria if it's over 30 millimeters mercury. The decreased uh, renal perfusion will lead to ischemia, and this may also contribute to acute renal failure, which will then need renal replacement therapy. And also neurologic symptoms may occur due to inferior vena cava compression, since it will lead to an elevated CVP and therefore lead to increased intracranial pressure and then a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. So all in all, the diminished venous drainage may consequently cause intestinal and mesenteric vascular venous congestion, ischemia and edema, which will then result in a vicious cycle that increases IAP, creating IAH, uh, intra-abdominal hypertension, and further de development of ACS. The diagnosis. So first of all, we need to different, uh, identify the different risk factors that may lead to the ACS. The World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome recommends to screen for IAH and ACS when two or more risk factors are present. And if elevated, intra-abdominal pressure should be monitored every four to six hours. So, um, the physical exam, you may find there increased abdominal girth, tense abdomen, cyanosis, wheezing, or difficulty in breathing, but that's quite not sensitive enough because you can have these symptoms basically in other um, diseases as well. We can use imaging modalities, but it's neither sensitive nor specific for that. We can just maybe find a cause that will lead to that, but not um, the di definite diagnosis that there is hypertension. The most conclusive one is measurement, which can be direct or indirect. This is the most um, accurate manner to uh, confirm the diagnosis and um, should be measured when any known risk of intra-abdominal hypertension is um, present. So direct would be, for example, by pressure transducers, um, by uh, the root of the peritoneum. Uh, indirect can be by stomach, by intragastric catheter, but the most commonly used one is the transbladder technique that's used. So the transbladder technique, one has to first say that the pressure in the bladder itself is already one to three millimeters mercury higher than in the abdomen. And um, it can be inaccurate if the patient is not sedated or lying flat. And the measurement should be taken at end expiration and in a complete supine uh, position. It's uh, lower than five millimeters mercury in a healthy person. 
and over 25 millimeters mercury is suspicious for abdominal compartment syndrome. There are certain contraindications for this, which are bladder trauma, neurogenic bladder, BPH, and pelvic hematoma. And um, if we have this um, diagnosed, there is also a management algorithm, which is defined by the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. And this is basically just to have a quick overview that there are these algorithms and one can also take this as a help for the diagnosis and the management. And just to have this um, quickly revised, and there are five important steps to be memorized. So one um, should evacuate the intraluminal contents um, by, for example, nasogastric or uh, rectal decompression, empty the abdominal and or retroperitoneal extraluminal contents by percutaneous drainage, for example, to improve the abdom and also improve the abdominal wall compliance by sedation and analgesia. And of course, optimize the fluid administration. One should have a balanced resuscitation and also maybe use uh, vasopressors. And one thing that is very important to indicate early surgical intervention. So the gold standard for surgical decompression is the decompressive median pubic laparotomy, which is a, full, a vertical full thickness midline incision through all the layers of um, the abdominal wall from the xiphoid process to the pubic symphysis. Early surgical intervention resulted in about 80% fewer complications and um, it can be made either on the ICU or on the, in the OR. For the laparotomy afterwards, um, we would aim for the open abdominal treatment. Uh, we will do the temporary abdominal closure um, by negative pressure wound therapy. And um, this contributes to some advantages of this procedure uh, since it will have appropriate evacuation of ascites, which is rich on pro-inflammatory markers and contamination. Um, it may improve the nursing care and also um, contribute to earlier fascia closure rates. And complications may be, of course, it's an open abdomen, it can lead to infections, uh, fluid loss, anterocutaneous fistula formation, or even eventual hernias. Um, the re-exploration should uh, not take longer than 24 to 48 hours after the index operation, and the optimal pressure of the uh, negative wound therapy would be about minus 125 millimeters mercury, um, and Lower levels of, um, for example, minus 70 millimeters mercury should be aimed when there is a suspicion of active bleeding due to co or um, coagulopathy is suspected. So the definitive fascia closure is the fascia to fascia closure. Um, it should be attempted within four to seven days after the index operation and as a recommended strategy for both trauma and non-trauma patients. And non-infectious uh, post-traumatic and non-traumatic hemorrhage um, it's achievable about uh, 75 to 100 percent in abdominal sepsis. The primary closure is possible in only about 50 percent of the cases. Delaying a primary facial closure over seven days poses significant risk of increased complications, as we already heard. For example, the loss of uh, soft tissue coverage, lateralization of the fascia, malnutrition, and formation of enteric fistula. And um, there are different surgical reconstruction techniques that may facilitate the definitive closure. For example, by anterior or posterior component separation, uh, using prosthetic mesh traction by sublay meshes, which um, have low recurrence for hernias, or um, use a, a split thickness graft um, on the visceral surface with a plant delayed definitive closure. The prognosis left untreated or um, having a delayed treatment for ACS can be fatal because it has very high mortality rates. It can uh, lead to multi-organ failure, which can uh, lead to uh, delay of the recovery for weeks or even months uh, due to prolonged need for mechanical ventilation and dialysis and uh, many other reasons. This is basically the chart will, which will um, show you how high the prevalence and uh, the mortality rates are. In IAH grade one, um, it's only about 10 to 25%, while in ACS, it can be even up to 90%. So a quick um, recap of what we already heard. 
Um, the measurement of IAP bus is significant prognostic value. IAH and ACS are frequently associated with a poor outcome. Early and on ongoing assessment, including serial IAP measurements, should be monitored in any patient with a suspicion of IAH and AC or ACS. And um, one should go for early uh, surgical decompression rather than delayed, um, as we already heard. The guidelines of the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. And these are basically more or less used as a go to see um, how to manage that, but it's not very strictly ruled that you have to go to these guidelines because sometimes it's a clinical um, evaluation if you go for the abdominal decompression by surgery rather than uh, wait for the um, measurement of the transbladder by transplant technique. So sometimes you have to do individual decision making. So that would be it. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Charlotte. Um, I think an uh, important thing here is uh, the key points. Uh, you have to see which patients are at risk who can develop such an uh, acute abdominal compartment syndrome. You have to know their patients that you can avoid um, this, this syndrome. And um, the, 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 the measurement of the blood pressure is, is only a diagnostic tool. Um, you have to see the patient in all his, his, his matters. You have to see um, who is at risk. And um, you sometimes have also to decompress the abdominal wall if the, a, uh, the blood pressure is under these 20 millimeters, for sure. And it's a diagnostic tool, and, um, but it's also important the faster this um, blood pressure is rising, um, perhaps you faster have to go for treatment. And um, also the severity of this organ dysfun uh, dysfunction or failure this the more aggressive has the ther uh, th therapy to be. Yeah. So are there any questions for uh, about this topic? Well, thank you very much for this uh, topic, which is important, not too well covered. I mean, I think we don't speak too often that. I think there are many cases that are underdiagnosed or end up to the wrong side and are not uh, recognized. I think just as a comment, one factor is continuity of care also here, right? I mean, that's also today we have a danger which we protect more the time of the doctors sometimes than the health of the patient. And that's certainly a risk, uh, including ICU where there is no continuity. And that's uh, something we can miss. If you're really in charge of a patient and put your hand on the belly, I think, as you mentioned, before all these technologies, the clinic, the risk factors, and then we can, we can uh, intervene in this uh, function. Do we have an idea about the incidence of this Compartment syndrome, for example, here? Um, incidence, no, it's not. We didn't get some data from it. Um, it's, it's difficult because um, there are so many um, risk factors, and it's, these are all the critically ill patients who can um, create this syndrome. And if you, if you mentioned, if you, if you see the patient at risk, um, you have to be on it, you have to be evaluate regularly the patient, uh, go for this. Uh, diagnostic tools and uh, if there is an organ failure and the, the, um, the, um, the blood pressure is rising very fast, go for the decompression. What would be the decision to close it? I mean, though you, you do a decompression, it's pretty aggressive surgery. You have to open the belly, let open, so there is no pressure. It's pretty uh, obvious. Uh, uh, if that goes in the good direction, what will you when will you decide to close it again? Usually with a mesh, that's what we may do, but when, what, how do you decide this? Um, I think this is also an interdisciplinary um, um, discussion with the uh, with the ICU. So if the um, if the patient stabilizes, if the if you can the, um, the the flood recitation is you can negative the balance uh, the fluid balance, um, and if you see that it goes in the right direction, then you can close it perhaps stepwise, and then you can see um, if you do first round perhaps with a um, bridging mesh. If you see it goes in the right direction, you can go. Every, every um, step, every operation, you go a little bit close to the abdomen um, a bit more. Okay, good. Thank you.